Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, this is Professor Shantanu Tripathi and today I will be continuing with what we had discussed in the other session on treatment of pain and use of drugs for treating pain. As we have discussed that broadly the medicines that are used for treating pain are called analgesics. Of course, you also mentioned that there are some exceptions to this definition or to this rule. There are also some non-analgesic drugs which are used for treating pain that may also we discuss towards the later part. But now we will be discussing analgesics and in today's discussion in this session we will be concentrating on focusing on a group of analgesics which are also known as NSAID analgesics or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug analgesics. So, this is a this is a specific group as opposed to this there are also other groups of analgesics they are called opioid analgesics which act by stimulating the opioid receptors. Today right now we will be discussing the NSAID analgesics. Of all the drugs which are used in the treatment of pain we can broadly classify them as narcotic or opioid analgesics, NSAID analgesics that is these are the groups of drugs NSAID analgesics that act via inhibiting the synthesis of prostaglandins which are actually mediators of pain. Then we will also have some discussion on topical analgesics which are not analgesics when they are not given systemically they are applied locally or uh, they are called topical analgesics. Adjuvant analgesics which by themselves are not really analgesics, but uh, they have some other primary uh, actions, pharmacological actions and uses, but uh, sometimes they are also used in some pain conditions, particularly chronic pain conditions. They are called adjuvant analgesics, some people call them co-analgesics. We also will be discussing a little bit about analgesic combinations. When more than one analgesic drugs are combined together or maybe one analgesic with other non-analgesic drugs they are combined together. And uh, we will have some discussion on non-analgesics in the treatment of pain. Today's discussion we will be limiting ourselves to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug analgesics or prostaglandin synthesis inhibitor analgesics. We will also talk a little bit about topical analgesics, we will talk about adjuvant analgesics just touch upon and also speak about analgesic combinations. <coughs> non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs they also have analgesic property and so these group of analgesics may also be called as NSAID analgesics. They are from the very name it suggests that they are not steroids so far as their structure is concerned, chemical structure is concerned, they are synthetic agents unlike steroids <coughs> which are natural substances corticosteroids. Now, there is a huge heterogeneity in their structure and chemical nature of the different drugs that fall in this category of NSAID analgesics, but what is the common thread in them all of them are otherwise uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and all of them are have have considerable analgesic property. Now, all are anti-inflammatory agents also from the name it suggests, but there is exception like paracetamol is an exception which is which does not have uh, analgesic anti-inflammatory property. So, paracetamol has analgesic and antipyretic activity. Otherwise, all NSAID analgesics are analgesic and antipyretic effective the uh, NSAID analgesics are effective against pain associated with inflammation primarily. And so, 
they are more effective in integumental pain that is pain related to injury in superficial structures in skin, in muscles and in joints broadly speaking. There are exceptions though. While as compared to these type of analgesics, if you think of opioid analgesics, they are more effective in deep seated chronic kind of dull aching pains that originate from the viscera and deeper structures in ligaments and bones etcetera. Now, NSAID analgesics all of these analgesics they act by inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis. Of course, again there is an exception nephopam is a non prostaglandin synthesis inhibitor, but it is uh, otherwise considered as uh, an analgesics NSAID analgesic it has anti inflammatory property also. Some of the NSAID analgesics they have additional uricosuric action. Aspirin which is a, you can we can say that it is a prototype of this NSAID analgesic group, but in low doses aspirin has platelet anti aggregatory action and it has otherwise useful indication or important uh, use in clinical medicine for its anti platelet aggregatory action where it is used for secondary prevention in mitral infarction in stroke and also in primary prevention sometimes although recent evidence suggest that it is possibly not protecting to that extent uh, for uh, cardiovascular accidents or uh, for that matter in case of uh, mitral infarction primary prevention now of course different kind of evidence is coming against is use in primary prevention non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs they broadly as a class do not cause central nervous system depression or dependence they do not have dependence liability this is opposed to what we find with opioid analgesics <coughs> which cause cns depression which cause respiratory depression which cause addiction and dependence <coughs> non steroidal anti inflammatory drug analgesics or NSAID analgesics <coughs> they primarily cause inactivation of cyclo oxygenase. Cyclo oxygenase is the enzyme that is required for synthesis of prostaglandins. Now, <coughs> we might have heard about a uh, molecule called arachidonic acid. Now, this arachidonic acid is formed from phospholipids. Phospholipid as we know the cell wall is composed of phospholipids and when the cell is injured or the tissue is injured. So, these phospholipids they are exposed and they are acted upon by phospholipase A2 which is an enzyme and there is synthesis of arachidonic acid and arachidonic acid remains the substrate for different prostanoids. Prostanoid is a term that refers to different types of prostaglandins prostaglandin G, prostaglandin H group, prostacycline or prostaglandin uh, I, thromboxanes these are all together are called prostanoids out of which the prostaglandin E2 which is known to be responsible for which is an important mediator of pain physiologically. Now, if the prostaglandin synthesis can be inhibited thereby so, uh, the, the sensitivity or sensitization of the pain receptors in the peripheral nerve uh, by prostaglandin that cannot take place and thereby there is less pain sensation that is carried from the periphery to the center. So, that is the uh, basis of how the NSAID analgesics they otherwise produce uh, relief of pain. Now, there are two types of cyclooxygenase or COX in uh, brief. One is COX-1, the other is COX-2. COX-1 is called constitutive uh, enzyme which is there in all cells and uh, which is always present and COX-2 is inducive, in, inducive kind of enzyme which is induced only when there is inflammation, when there is tissue injury and inflammation and there is release of cytokines, interleukins. TNF alpha, tissue necrosis factor alpha. So, they actually induce the, uh, the, uh, the presence of or the uh, availability of COX 2 
COX-1 in all tissues as we have said, particularly in the gastrointestinal tract, in kidneys, in endothelial cells, in platelets, while COX-2 is found in uh, the brain, in bone, in the kidneys, in the gastrointestinal tract and uh, in the uterus. Now, prostaglandins apart from being an important mediator for pain, they also regulate vascular tone and platelets and have important role in protection of kidneys and stomach. And this clearly then indicates that when prostaglandins are uh, synthesis in inhibited non-selectively, then they, that will also have impact on the regulation that is imparted by prostaglandins physiologically on vascular tone, on platelet aggregation, on uh, uh, renal protection or uh, integrity of the stomach epithelium. So, there will be then side effects when you use these kind of analgesics that can be the side effects of NSAID analgesics can be explained by again by virtue of their ability to non-selectively uh, inhibit the synthesis of different kinds of prostaglandins. Now, out of all the non steroidal anti inflammatory drug analgesics, NSAID analgesics, aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid and the other more traditional non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, they inhibit non selectively both the COX 1 and COX 2 enzymes. Now, this cartoon <coughs> this shows the mechanism of action of non steroidal anti inflammatory analgesics, okay, uh, how it causes analgesia or relief of pain. So, here you see in the cell membrane. Uh, where arachidonic acid is esterified in the membrane phospholipid, if there is an injury that phospholipid is, is exposed to phospholipase A2 okay, by phospholipase A2 and there is formation of this arachidonic acid. Now, while corticosteroids will inhibit phospholipase A2 and thereby availability of arachidonic acid which is the substrate for prostaglandin synthesis, the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs they act at a lower level that is at the level where arachidonic acid gives rise to or synthesizes prostaglandins or prostaglandin G2 which is actually an unstable intermediate and following which there is prostaglandin H2 formation which are called prostanoids, prostaglandins, prostacyclines or thromboxanes. Okay. So, these are the different uh, steps where the steroids or the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or for that matter acetaminophen that is paracetamol they can produce their action. Okay. So, because of bacterial injury or the macrophage, so in case of infections when there is inflammation or in infection, so these stimuli will also stimulate this phospholipase enzyme as a result of which arachidonic acid is more available. And then non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, they when they block this COX 1 or COX 2 non selectively, they will cause less synthesis of the prostanoids as a result of which on one hand there will be less pain and less inflammation, on the other hand there will be some side effects also that can be explained by this. Now, the adverse effects of NSAID analgesics in order to understand that let us take this help of this particular cartoon and here we find that the GI mucosa gastrointestinal mucosa that is rich in COX 1 cyclooxygen is one enzyme and <coughs> when it is blocked by NSAID analgesics, so there is less synthesis of prostaglandin E 2. COX 1 is responsible for arachidonic acid when it is acted upon arachidonic acid is acted upon by COX 1, there is synthesis of prostaglandin E 2 which is responsible for gastric protection, increased mucus secretion, increased bicarbonate or my mucosal blood flow. So, all these will be affected as a result of which there will be ulceration, peptic ulceration, peptic ulcer disease will be aggravated and there will be gastrointestinal bleeding in with COX-1 inhibition. When you talk of kidneys, in kidney both COX-1 and COX-2 uh, enzymes that are there when non-selectively by non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs would block them. So, there will be uh, less synthesis of prostaglandin on one end and also prostacycline. So, thereby there will be Afferent arteriolar vasodilation will take place with increased uh, the glomerular filtration rate, and there will be more increased sodium and water excretion. Now, so when there is inhibition, this is these are the effects of prostaglandin and prostacyclic. 
So, if they are inhibited these enzymes cyclooxygenase 1 and 2, so there will be sodium and water retention, there will be hypertension and hemodynamic acute kidney injury. So, that is why what we find that uh, somebody who is hypertensive under well controlled with antihypertensive and you give for some other reason non steroidal anti inflammatory drug and the hypertension control is lost. Same is true with heart failure when in heart failure if you give the <coughs> when once we give the non steroidal anti inflammatory analgesics there will be increased tendency of uh, sodium and water retention or edema. So, there will also be because of hemodynamic acute kidney injury, it can also non long term long, uh, long term use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs can also cause uh, nephrotoxicity. Nephropathy is, is, a, uh, is, is, is a typical adverse effect of uh, long term NSAID use. On the other hand, if you think of the cardiac tissue, cardiovascular system there again the prostacycline and the thromboxane which otherwise remains in a balance that and they also uh, extend uh, they also have a very important physiological role in the vascular system in the blood vessel the cox2 or the cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme is present and the prostacycline synthesis if you inhibit the cox2 there will be prostacycline synthesis will be hampered the prostacycline is otherwise responsible for causing vasodilation and inhibition of platelet aggregation and that will uh, take place and uh, when it is inhibited and uh, the uh, thromboxane A2 if it is uh, which is there in platelet there is COX1 selectively it is present. So, which is responsible for uh, thromboxane is responsible platelet aggregation. So, when you give NSAIDs there will be anti aggregatory effect and particularly in the when you give uh, the, the balance is actually altered. The COX 2 inhibition usually when non, when, uh, non selectively NSAID is used. So, the uh, COX 2 inhibition is usually more than COX 1 as a result of which there could be a possibility of uh, cardiovascular adverse effects like stroke or MI and this is precisely the reason why some of the so called selective uh, NSAID or COX 2 selective NSAID, COX 2 selective NSAID they were developed in order to avoid the COX 1 selective gastropathy and nephropathy, but then that is that benefit is again outweighed by its, its propensity to have more cardiac toxicity in the form of cardiovascular toxicity in the form of more myocardial infarction or stroke and as a result of which some of such selective uh, COX 2 inhibitors like uh, rofecoxib, valdecoxib they had to be withdrawn from the market. When you talk of aspirin at the low dose when aspirin is given it irreversibly in its inhibits platelet COX 1 uh, cyclooxygenase 1 thereby the uh, thromboxane synthesis is, is inhibited. So, it, it can exert and platelet anti aggregatory activity and which is actually uh, utilized for use of low dose aspirin in prevention of or secondary prevention of myocardial infarction or stroke. So, this is in a nutshell to explain uh, the different adverse effects of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. So, then the we can have this mechanistic classification of NSAID analgesics uh, starting with non selective irreversible COX inhibition uh, that is caused by drugs like aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid and its congener whether it is alpha salazine, whether it is methyl salicylate or whatever and this is actually non selective irreversible COX inhibition both COX 1 and COX 2 they are inhibited. Non selective reversible COX inhibition is caused by drugs like ibuprofen very commonly used diclofenac, indomethacin, mephenamic acid, naproxen, pyroxicum, ketorolac. Then we have preferential COX 2 inhibition, uh, they are not very highly selective, but relatively as compared to COX 1 it is more uh, preferentially it will they will inhibit COX 2. The examples are meloxicum, etodolac or nebumetone. Similarly, we have another group which is more selective towards COX 2 inhibition. These are the COXIBs 
selicoxib, valdicoxib, etoricoxib, etc. Uh, this valdicoxib and also rofecoxib, so they have uh, been withdrawn, but we have still uh, selicoxib or etoricoxib or paracoxib, etc. So, these are selective COX-2 inhibitors, there are some benefits of using selective COX-2 inhibitors, particularly they are used in situations where you need uh, relatively prolonged use uh, in, in different kind of arthritis, whether it is rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, so, there uh, this is the advantage that the nephropathy or the gastropathy will be uh, risk could be less, but uh, at the same time one has to be watchful whether the cardiovascular risk is increasing or not. And precisely because of this increased cardiovascular risk at least two molecules they have been withdrawn rofecoxib in recent past rofecoxib or valdecoxib. Then we have the partial COX-2 selective inhibition drugs that cause partial COX-2 selective inhibition and plus there is additional free radical scavenging. So, one uh, typical uh, drug that would uh, produce its analgesic effect by these mechanisms is nimesulide another is sulindac. And finally, we have a analgesic which does not have anti-inflammatory property, it has only analgesic and antipyretic activity and that is paracetamol or the other name for paracetamol is acetaminophen. So, it actually causes a reversible inhibition of hypothalamic COX-1 and possibly also recent evidence has come that COX-3 inhibition also takes place with paracetamol. So, so far as the uh, just to uh, summarize the role of cyclooxygenase. So, these are enzymes that are uh, required for synthesis of prostaglandins. Now, there are different isozymes uh, COX-1, COX-2, COX-1 present in all tissues, COX-2 in found in the central nervous system in brain, also in bone, kidneys, gastrointestinal tract and in uterus. Uh, they broadly they prevent prostaglandins synthesis and thereby prostaglandin cannot uh, cause sensitization of the uh, pain receptors in the periphery and uh, thereby can produce its uh, uh, analgesic action. Addition, additionally, prostaglandins also will, uh, will facilitate the uh, mediation other, other pain modulators. Okay like bradykinin, like 5-hydroxytryptamine, like different cytokines towards sensitization of these pain receptors that also will be prevented because of there will be less prostaglandin available because of synthesis inhibition. Now, in the, and in the platelet the COX-1 uh, inhibition with low dose of aspirin will, will uh, cause uh, antiplatelet activity. So, which will remain for 7 to 10 days. Uh, and thereby it can it can interfere with blood coagulation and increase the risk of bleeding. Uh, but uh, uh, low dose aspirin is used for uh, for uh, inhibiting the synthesis of thromboxin. But in this case, because of the COX-1 inhibition in the platelets, there will be uh, tendency towards uh, increased risk of bleeding. Coming to aspirin, which is the prototype of NSAID analgesics. Aspirin is a drug which is not used only for analgesia, it is also has an antipyretic activity, it has anti-inflammatory actions, it has platelet anti-aggregatory activity, it is also used for closure of, pit of ductus arteriosus after birth, immediately after birth, prior to birth we need this aperture ductus arteriosus which is a, which is a channel between the pulmonary artery and the aorta during the fetal life. The uh, in order to maintain the fetal circulation this is required, <coughs> but after the baby is born this needs to be closed and this closure usually happens physiologically, but in case it does not happen then we have to give a prostaglandin synthesis inhibitor uh, or rather uh, the COX inhibitor because this COX enzyme cyclooxygenase enzyme is responsible for this for uh, this patency and in order to close you have to inhibit that uh, cyclooxygenase. So, that is that is another use of aspirin. Uh, apart from that other uses are prolonged low dose aspirin, uh, actually it is 100 milligram uh, that can be uh, used. Uh, colon cancer, familial colon polyposis, uh, here again the COX-2 is responsible in this. 
the preeclampsia uh, again thromboxane is responsible reducing the risk of Alzheimer's in all these cases aspirin has been tried and used with some success. But when you talk of pain relief as analgesic aspirin uh, dose of analgesic dose of aspirin is 300 to 600 milligram it is actually beneficial in uh, treating mild to moderate pain of inflammation uh, in the peripheral tissue musculoskeletal pain, uh, myalgia, body ache, headache, toothache and uh, uh, joint pain, knee pain, back pain. Uh, when you talk of headache in addition to reduction of prostaglandin induced in addition to the uh, usual mechanism there is also that uh, cerebral vasodilation which is actually a cause of headache that can also be reduced by synthesis, prostaglandin synthesis inhibition. Uh, aspirin has also been used in dysmenorrhea which is a painful menstruation in females and uh, also aspirin has been used for relieving pain of trauma and surgery, post surgical pain or as a, a post operative in post operative analgesia. Aspirin also has antipyretic activity, the dose is same as that is used for an, in analgesia that is 300 to 600 milligram. Basically it acts in the central nervous system and causes resetting of the hypothalamic therm thermostat. It also has anti-inflammatory uh, uses 3 to 6 gram per day uh, can be used in osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatic fever. Uh, but then because of its poor tolerability of on this high dose over a long period. So, more uh, safer agents uh, are used these days in, uh, as anti-inflammatory. Besides we have discussed about platelet anti-aggregatory 70 to 100 milligram for secondary prevention of MI and stroke. It also used in uh, deep vein thrombosis, prevention of deep vein thrombosis, prevention of uh, pulmonary embolism. So, all these aspirin has a uh, has use. Adverse effects as we have already discussed gastritis and gastric bleed that is because of COX-1 inhibition and because of ion trapping. There is general ble bleeding tendency is increased because of a prolongation of uh, prothrombin time. Respiratory alkalosis with a relatively lesser dose uh, and salicylism which is uh, featured by headache, patient presents with headache, vertigo, tinnitus, hypoventilation, nausea and, and vomiting and uh, there could be respiratory acidosis also if a higher dose is used and higher concentration of aspirin is in the circulation and gradually if it is not uh, uh, attended then it will uh, progress to metabolic acidosis and the patient will present with hyperpyrexia paradoxically. Uh, although aspirin has an antipyretic effect, but at higher doses it can cause hyperpyrexia, loss of vision, visomotor collapse, renal failure, convulsions and coma. Uh, aspirin is also known to cause chronic nephritis and renal papillary necrosis which is called uh, aspirin nephropathy. We also come across a uh, situation called Rice syndrome which is a rare but fatal disorder that happens in children. Uh, young children with acute viral illness and in uh, there is actually uh, encephalopathy, there is fatty infiltration of the liver, pancreas and kidneys and spleen and lymph nodes. So, there is fatty infiltra infiltration to all these organs and there is encephalopathy. So, Rice syndrome is uh, a, a, a real concern for use of aspirin in young children and in fact that is the reason aspirin is not used in very young children particularly when there is uh, febrile uh, episodes. So, we better use uh, safer agents like paracetamol. Contraindications of aspirin to start with peptic ulcer disease, uh, it can aggravate bleeding disorders any kind that will be also uh, the bleeding tendency will be increased, impaired renal function, hypersensitivity reactions or aspirin allergy children with viral fever as we have mentioned right now because of the danger of uh, Ray syndrome. Then alcoholics due to possible liver damage and those receiving warfarin because of the, the uh, displacement from the protein binding sites of warfarin, aspirin can displace and thereby more as uh, warfarin induced uh, bleeding will take place besides of course, the aspirin's contribution towards bleeding 
adverse effects. Now coming to the next group that is non-selective reversible COX-2 inhibitors, other uh, non-selective aspirin is also a non-selective uh, irreversible COX inhibitors and here we talk of non-selective reversible COX inhibitors and uh, we have a good number of agents. It is difficult to really uh, say one is superior to the other, uh, one has some advantage, the other has some other advantage, but the key features in each we can discuss. Uh, ibuprofen is safer and better tolerated than aspirin. It, it has analgesic, antipyretic and anti-inflammatory effects and uh, similar indications uh, used in integumental pain, used in peripheral pain like more or less resembling aspirin. Uh, in an anti-inflammatory effects of course, for a uh, it can be used on a uh, intermediate uh, pro duration or a long duration also. There are uh, similar congeners in this group of ibuprofen like drugs like flarbiprofen which is used also top mainly topically and for ophthalmic use, ketoprofen which has an additional liposomal stabilizing action. So, uh, ketoprofen can also be used uh, orally. Uh, besides prostaglandin synthesis inhibition, it has additional liposome, lysosomal stabilizing action which also contributes to its uh, anti-inflammatory and analgesic effect. Then we have diclofenac, it is otherwise a commonly used uh, anti-inflammatory drug which is com also used for uh, pain in treating painful conditions. Moderate potency as compared to aspirin and also tolerability as compared to aspirin, moderate tolerability. The its protein binding is high 99 percent and that is the reason it is not given in by intravenous route. It has additional mode of action like it reduces superoxide degeneration at inflammatory sites. Diclofenac is also used topically and in ophthalmic practice uh, as anti-inflammatory. It is given orally, uh, besides it is given orally which when it is given 50 milligram 3 times daily. There are other drugs as congener of diclofenac like aciclofenac which is a longer acting, uh, longer acting than diclofenac 100 milligram BID is used while diclofenac is given 3 times a day, aciclofenac can be given twice a day. Newer drugs like nepafenac which is actually a pro drug of uh, amphenac, the active component is amphenac which is used as an eye drop in cataract surgery, inflammation because of during surgery, during cataract uh, and particularly in the post operative period it is used as eye drop. We have drugs like diflunisal which is a aspirin derivative really which is more potent analgesic anti-inflammatory than aspirin, but which has no antipyretic effect it does because it does not cross the blood barrier. So, it cannot produce that central action. Diflunisal use has been limited only in in cancer pain or in pain due to metastasis of cancer. When you talk of aspirin poisoning, it occurs with large doses that saturate the metabolic pathway and uh, slow elimination that cause drug accumulation. And uh, we need to recognize the features of aspirin poisoning like nausea and vomiting, hematemesis, fever patients also present with fluid and electrolyte deficiencies, there is tinnitus, there is decreased hearing, there is hyperventilation, confusion, visual changes, delirium, stupor and coma. Ideally one should try to measure the serum concentration, uh, but then it, it may not be available always. Treatment is in general with intravenous fluids and sodium bicarbonate. Gastric lavage is to be given for any unabsorbed aspirin that is to be uh, eliminated. Activated charcoal helps in uh, preventing absorption of any, any uh, leftover aspirin which is there in the intestine. Liquid antacids will help in uh, alleviating the local GI symptoms. Sometimes hemodialysis may be required in order to eliminate the aspirin that is in circulation. Coming back to non-selective reversible COX inhibitors, we have endomethacin 
we also have naproxen, we have mephenamic acid, we have ketorolac, we have pyroxicum. Endomethacin has apart from being uh, COX inhibition or non-selective COX inhibition both COX1 and COX2, it also has an additional phospholipase A2 inhibition like corticosteroid and besides that it also have immunosuppressive action. Now, all these actions together makes it a uh, uh, good agent or preferred agent for treating uh, pain in, in some specific conditions like ankylosing spondylitis or in gout. Uh, it is definitely more potent, but again at the same time less tolerable than aspirin. The dose of indomethacin is 25 milligram twice a day or three times a day. Uh, it should not be used in psychiatry patients, in epilepsy and also in pregnancy because it is not safe uh, particularly for the fetus when it is used in the first trimester. Coming back to nap naproxen, naproxen is also uh, another agent uh, which is a non-selective reversible COX inhibitor, both COX1 and COX2 are inhibited. It is longer acting as compared to aspirin, moderate potency and tolerability compared to aspirin. It over and above the COX inhibition, it also causes additional leukocyte migration inhibition which otherwise would facilitate the inflammation and the pain. Like indomethacin, naproxen is also use also is limited in gout. Dose is 250 milligram twice a day. Besides this use, it also has topical and ophthalmic uses naproxen. Then we have mephenamic acid. This is a non sterile drug which has additional prostaglandin receptor blocking action besides the prostaglandin synthesis inhibition. Over and above that it also has phospholipase A2 inhibition. Now, mephenamic acid is unique in the sense that it is used particularly in dysmenorrhea. It can be used in arthritis also, but its main use is in dysmenorrhea and the dose is 250 to 500 milligram three times a day. We have then ketorolac, which is a drug, non sterile drug, which is particularly which is used in ophthalmic practice, but orally when it is given 10 to 20 milligram to four times a day, it is used in only short term management of pain, not more than five days. Again, because of its uh, poor safety profile, it can cause uh, particularly the uh, nephrotoxicity and also some uh, the hematological toxicity. Coming to pyroxicum, apart from prostaglandin synthesis inhibition, it causes additionally inhibit neutrophil activation. Pyroxicum is relatively longer acting as compared to aspirin and it is given once daily, 20 milligram once daily orally. Besides pyro for pyroxicum, we also have ophthalmic and topical uses. Next group we have this preferential COX-2 inhibition. So, these drugs they preferentially they actually inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2, but the COX-2 inhibition is much more as compared to COX-1 inhibition. We have drugs like cetodolac which has a better gastrointestinal tract tolerability as compared to aspirin. Similarly, it is more potent than aspirin. Oral dose is 200 to 400 milligram twice a, three, three times a day. We have meloxicum as compared to pyroxicum, it is it has a greater preference towards COX-2 inhibition. So, it is longer acting, it is better tolerated than aspirin and it is given 7.5 to 15 milligram once daily orally. We have nebumetone, another long acting agent which is basically a pro drug and it is better tolerated uh, than aspirin and the dose is 500 to 1000 milligram once daily. Let us now go to the selective COX-2 inhibitors, which is otherwise in short called cox -sibs. And uh, we have uh, a number of agents under this group, starting with selicoxib. We have valdecoxib, itoricoxib, paricoxib, and uh, this paricoxib is actually a prodrug of valdecoxib, which is given parenterally. And uh, the, the one we also mentioned about rofecoxib, which has now withdrawn, and also valdecoxib, which are now withdrawn because of their adverse cardiovascular adverse effects. Now, so far as the coxibs are concerned, their COX-2 inhibition is 50 times more than their inhibition of COX-1. 
So, they are so much selective towards COX-2 inhibition. There is little almost little or no effect on COX-1 in the gastrointestinal tract and in platelets. So, thereby there is less GIT side effects and there is less chances of bleeding. Prolonged use would enhance cardiovascular risks. Basically, there is an altered prostacycline thromboxane ratio. So, rofecoxib and valdecoxib this is the reason why they have been withdrawn because of the increased cardiovascular risk. The coxibs use of coxibs are limited to uh, the prolonged use osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis and dysmenorrhea. We have another drug NSAID analgesic and uh, that is unique in its nature in reference to its, its partial COX-2 selective inhibition. Additionally, it has free radical scavenging action. Now, overall it, it has an overall weak prostaglandin synthesis inhibition. COX-2 inhibition is 5 to 10 times more than COX-1 inhibition. It has a reduced superoxide generation, free radical scavenging action also is there. Inhibition of platelet activating factor synthesis and inhibition of metalloproteinase activity in cartilage. So, all these and because of this inhibition of metalloproteinase activity in the cartilage, the cartilage or erosion or injury is also prevented. Now, because of all these uh, nimesulide is preferred in not only in pain management, but also in uh, inflammation as anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, the other advantage is like aspirin it do, does not cause bronchospasm and uh, the other important information is it, it there is no cross tolerance with aspirin. That means, if aspirin is causing bronchospasm in a patient of asthma who is receiving aspirin, that does not mean if you switch from aspirin to nimesulide, uh, the likelihood of uh, same kind of bronchospasm will be less. So, no cross that is what is called no cross tolerance with aspirin. Nimesulide is otherwise contraindicated in presence of hepatic injury or hepatic impairment, particularly when you talk of children, young children, uh, there the chances of nimesulide induced hepatitis or hepatotoxicity will be more. So, that is why it is not favored in children and uh, the oral dose of nimesulide is 100 milligram twice a day. Nimesulide is otherwise also used topically and in ophthalmic preparation. Coming to paracetamol, paracetamol is unique in the sense under this group prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors that it does not possess anti-inflammatory property. It has a reversible hypothalamic COX-1 selective inhibitor, uh, it causes inhibition. So, paracetamol is a good and has a good and prompt antipyretic action by causing COX inhibition in the brain, it produces this antipyretic action. Both central COX-2 and uh, COX-1 inhibition takes place and perhaps an additional COX-3 inhibition also takes place. COX-3 off late it has been known that it is ac actually a variant of this COX-1. By all these mechanisms, paracetamol will finally reset the hypothalamic thermostat. Paracetamol has a central analgesic action, uh, but it, it is additive to aspirin's peripheral action. So, it is, it is uh, not that it is non-additive, it is, it is additive. Uh, it has a weak peripheral anti-inflammatory action, poor COX inhibition in the periphery. It do not share, it does not share the usual safety concerns of aspirin and is it is otherwise well tolerated. Orally, it is well absorbed. Uh, widely distributed in the circulation. It has a low protein binding, so it can be given parenterally. Uh, the glucuronide and sulphate conjugation takes place in the liver and that is how uh, paracetamol is metabolized in the liver and it is excreted, the glucuronide conjugate is excreted in the kidney. It has a half life of 2 to 3 hours and the duration of analgesic action or antipyretic action is 4 to 5 hours. Now, paracetamol poisoning has been a concern particularly in the waste. However, in our country also uh, if medicines are not kept beyond the reach of young children, there is a possibility that they can consume accidental poisoning of paracetamol may not be uncommon. And it usually occurs with a large dose that is more than 150 milligram per kg. So, uh, 
if it is more than 150 milligram per kg, say a child who is of 10 kg body weight, uh, he if he takes say uh, 1500 milligram, which means that uh, uh, just more than 3 paracetamol tablets, 500 milligram tablets. So, more than 3 tablets, 4 tablets if he consumes, if he swallows, then there will be uh, the poisoning will take place. Now, the features of this poisoning, the signs and symptoms are patient, the child would present with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, tenderness in the liver, the signs of hepatic and renal tubular necrosis, hypoglycemia is a feature, common feature, there would be jaundice and there is fulminating liver failure, the patient will go to coma and finally, may die if not, uh, if remain unattended. Now, the mechanism in order to understand the mechanism, if we concentrate on this uh, cartoon, here you see paracetamol, it is metabolized by the major pathway, whereby the paracetamol gets conjugated in the by the uh, phase 2 kind of reactions, uh, that is glucuronide conjugation and the conjugate is excreted in the urine. A minor pathway of, of paracetamol uh, metabolism takes place whereby the C450 uh, enzyme particularly uh, more specifically uh, the, the enzyme is CYP2E1 uh, that is responsible for metabolizing paracetamol to NAPQI. NAPQI is N-acetyl-P-benzoquinonimine is NAPQI. So, that is a minor metabolite of paracetamol but it is highly reactive, it causes oxidation of the sulfhydryl group of hepatic and renal cell proteins as a result of which there will be cell necrosis, hepatic necrosis or the renal necrosis, renal papillary necrosis. Now, this NABQI, it is detoxified by conjugation with glutathione. So, glutathione actually will eliminate NABQI by conjugating with NABQI and this conjugate, conjugated product is non-toxic which is then excreted in urine. Now, NAPQI is also can cause hepatotoxicity, besides it can also cause renal toxicity as we have just mentioned. Now, in a very young child, this glucuronide conjugation cannot happen because we, they do not have enough capacity to synthesize the glucuronidase enzyme if it is in premature child. So, the glucuronidase enzyme is not available enough. So, there will be accumulation of paracetamol and so, instead of this major pathway, the minor pathway will be activated because there will be more paracetamol available for this minor pathway and so, NAPQI will be produced and that NAPQI is otherwise toxic to ca causing hepatotoxicity. Okay. Uh, this can happen not only in young premature child, it can also happen in uh, an uh, adult person in whom also this, this enzyme is deficient for whatever reason. That is what is called the absolute and relative lack of glucuronide. Say for instance, you overwhelm this enzyme system by giving a very high dose of paracetamol. So, the dose is so high, the substrate availability is so high that enough glucuronide is not available for converting it to a, a conjugate. So, what happens then? There will be more free paracetamol will be available to go to the minor path, to take the minor path and there will thereby there will be more NAPQI synthesis will take place. Now, this NAPQI synthesis will then cause the separate toxicity. Now, glutathione if more substrate is available, more glutathione will be used up and ultimately glutathione will be soon depleted. It all depends on the uh, amount of paracetamol that has been consumed. Now, excess ac accumulation of NABQI will be responsible for all these hepatotoxicity and the acute reactions. In alcoholics, I, I was talking about how it can happen in the adult, particularly if somebody is alcoholic, even a 5 gram in a day intake of paracetamol that can cause severe acute toxicity, hepatic toxicity because alcohol, chronic alcoholism, it causes an induction of the hepatic enzyme that is responsible for conversion of paracetamol to NAPQI. 
So, that is how it, it takes place actually. So, uh, for replenishing glutathione how, how do we treat then? We need to we need to actually replenish glutathione. So, how can you do that? By giving promptly within 15 hours of exposure we have to start the treatment if it is beyond that possibly it is not going to help much and treat with N acetyl cysteine. The dose is 150 milligram per kg which is to be given intravenously in 200 milliliter of 5 percent glucose to be infused over 15 minutes and this is to be followed by the same dose to be given intravenously over the next 20 hours. We can also think of oral administration then we have to give 75 milligram per kg every 4 to 6 hours for 2 to 3 days. So, that is an alternative regimen. So, um, we need to treat uh, paracetamol poisoning promptly, urgently not more than a delay of 15 hours and then only we can expect a good result and the drug of choice is N acetyl cysteine which is actually will be replenishing the uh, depleted glutathione. Now, paracetamol is a drug which has been combined in, in uh, with many other uh, agents. A vast majority of fixed dose combination of analgesics, now we are talking of uh, analgesic combinations, combination analgesics. So, many of the combination analgesics uh, particularly when analgesics NSAID analgesics are combined with non analgesics. So, they are actually becomes unscientific or irrational. Combination of paracetamol with aspirin or other NSAIDs are additive only with a ceiling effect of around 1000 milligram. So, the total dose should not exceed uh, 1000 milligram because with that you are not expecting any addition to the efficacy analgesic efficacy, but the adverse effects will be increasing compounded. Combination of paracetamol with opioid analgesics are uh, may be synergistic because they have different mechanisms of actions. We have many combinations that are used starting with paracetamol 300 and codeine phosphate 30 milligram, paracetamol 1000, it could be paracetamol 100 or 650 plus codeine phosphate 60 milligram, paracetamol 500 or maybe 325 milligram with oxycodone uh, 5 milligram paracetamol 650 milligram with tramadol 75 milligram, paracetamol 650 milligram with dextropropoxyphene which is again an opioid analgesic. So, all these are opioid analgesic paracetamol combined with opioid analgesics. So, opioid analgesic dextropropoxyphene hydrochloride 65 milligram. So, all these types of combinations they are available they are otherwise rational combinations. Finally, towards the end for choosing the right and said that is a very difficult question because most of the time the choice is very empiric. However, factors that can determine the choice may include the cause of pain, the nature of pain whether it is deep seated pain, visceral pain or it is integumental pain whether it is associated with trauma or surgery all these factors whether it is a short lasting pain, acute pain or it is a prolonged pain, okay, chronic pain, okay, neuropathic pain. So, all these factors will decide whether uh, a, an, which analgesic can be used and uh, the patient specific risk factors whether the patient is a patient so he is already suffering from gastropathy, he is a patient of peptic ulcer disease, he has bronchospasm, he is a patient of hypertension, what is his age elderly or young very young child whether the, it is the pregnancy is there, the history of anaphylaxis past uh, a response to the same drug or the drug of the same group what is the cost of the treatment, patient preference if there is any, the other comorbidities as we just mentioned hypertension or cardiovascular, the, uh, the uh, ischemia, coronary ischemia uh, all these will, will actually determine uh, the concomitant medications and the adverse interaction potential with the concomitant medications all these are to be kept in mind while deciding the, uh, the NSAID analgesic that is going to be used. Finally, let us uh, just couple of words about topical analgesics. We have the different NSAIDs like diclofenac, ibuprofen, naproxen, ketoprofen, flarbiprofen, nimesulide, pyroxicum all these have been used in topical forms also in gels and is expected when it is applied locally there will be 
particularly in knee pain, particularly in uh, muscle pain. So, they have been used, they have been also been used as spray and is expected that they will be uh, benefiting. Uh, efficacy is not really based on very hard evidence, but uh, definitely they have a better safety profile as compared to systemic administration with like oral. We also have topical analgesics like uh, not necessarily NSAIDs, but uh, drugs like the counter irritants like capsaicin from canine papers uh, which is given topically it is indicated for post herpetic neuralgia in neuropathic pain, chronic neuropathic pain where substance P is implicated. Finally, the adjuvant analgesics, an adjuvant analgesic is actually a medication that is not primarily designed to uh, control pain, but demonstrates some pain relief property. Therefore, can be used for this purpose, also called co-analgesic. Some of the examples are antidepressants and anticonvulsants. They are actually used in chronic pain and in neuropathic pain. Chronic pain by definition, any pain that continues more than 6 weeks is called a chronic pain. Now, these adjuvant analgesics tend to be less effective for musculoskeletal pain such as back pain or joint pain. So, thank you very much. Uh, next session possibly will be discussing about the opioid analgesics and that will complete the our sessions on drugs used for pain management. Thank you.